This video is brought to you by Works Tools. You can get 10% off your first order by going to works.com and using the promo code BRAINFOOD. One word. The all-powerful pharaohs of ancient Egypt were frequently buried alongside a literal wealth of fabulous treasures. Treasures that, as you can probably imagine, the pharaohs were very keen to protect. So, did they actually have significant preventative measures in place to stop anyone from stealing their stuff after they'd gone a little moldy? Well, yes and no. But when it comes to the idea of elaborate booby traps or puzzles as depicted by Hollywood and in games, well, definitely not. To begin with, it is important to understand that generally the pharaohs' own subjects, and in some cases their direct successors, were the ones stealing their afterlife retirement plan. You see, a pharaoh's power was more or less absolute, and they could do pretty much anything they pleased. As a result, many pharaohs would have the tombs of their ancestors looted, in some case even reusing the items for their own burial. There are even stories of pharaohs unceremoniously having the mummy of their predecessor dumped out of their sarcophagus so that even the container could be reused. This was particularly the case in times of hardship, when Egyptian nobility would think nothing of ransacking the final rest place of a beloved family member or an ancestor because, well, technically, in their view, it was their stuff that was in there with them. A perk of being the ones who set the rules, this tomb raiding practice by the nobility was tolerated in the ancient Egyptian world. However, tomb raiding from individuals not directly related to the deceased wasn't as much, and it carried some rather harsh penalties. Punishments for raiding a tomb ranged from brutal death to public flogging, depending on how important the crypt that was destined desecrated was and the value of the item stolen. In regards to the kind of death penalty meted out to thieves, it was common practice to burn them alive. Well, why was this? Well, in addition to being a rather unpleasant way to die, this would condemn the thief to an eternity of nothingness due to the belief in ancient times that if you died without a body, you could not enter the afterlife. Other forms of execution include a decapitation, which would similarly mean the thief could not enter the afterlife, or impalement, which the ancient Egyptians believed would result in the spirit of the deceased being tied to that singular location forever. Obviously, this was seen as a very bad thing, and the hope of pharaohs was that such harsh punishment punishments would deter any potential thieves. Now, the problem with all of these punishments was that it would seem it was rather easy to get out of getting into any trouble at all. For example, consider this account of one 11th century BCE tomb raider, Amen Panifa, on both his method of tomb raiding and how he got out of trouble even when he was caught. We went to rob the tombs, as is our usual habit, and we found the pyramid of King Subankemsaf. This tomb being unlike the pyramids and tombs of the nobles, which we usually rob. We took our copper tools and forced away into the pyramid of this king through its innermost part. We located the underground chambers and, taking lighted candles in our hands, went down. We found the god lying at the back of his burial place, and we found the burial place of Queen Nupkas, his consort beside him it being protected and guarded by plaster and covered with rubble. We opened their sarcophagi and their coffins and found the noble mummy of the king equipped with a sword. There were a large number of amulets and jewels of gold on his neck, and he wore a headpiece of gold. The noble mummy of the king was completely covered in gold, and his coffins were decorated with gold and with silver inside and out, and inlaid with precious stones. We collected the gold that we found on the mummy of the god, including the amulets and jewels which were on his neck. We set fire to their coffins. After some days, the district officers of Thebes heard we had been robbing in the west, and they arrested me and imprisoned me in the office of the mayor of Thebes. I took the twenty deben of gold that represented my share, and I gave them to Kemob, the district scribe of the landing key of Thebes. He released me, and I rejoined my colleagues, and they compensated me with a share again. And so I got into the habit of robbing the tombs. Tomb raiding was so commonplace in ancient times that near enough every level of society took part in it, including, somewhat hilariously, the very people charged with constructing the tombs as well as those in charge of burying the dead. Sadly, while Hollywood would have you believe that the tombs of ancient pharaohs were teeming with any manner of deadly booby traps, the truth is much more vanilla. For starters, the idea of elaborate booby traps in ancient tombs is considered to be nothing more than a myth. To quote one Emily Teeter, an expert on Egyptian and Nubian antiquities working at the University of Chicago, I am really sorry to report that if curses are out, then there is really nothing devious. Hollywood has turned standard architectural features like sliding portcullis blocks, shafts, and sand-filled chambers 
into objects of horror. This isn't to say you won't find many reports of booby traps from otherwise seemingly reputable sources. Stating things like that Egyptian tombs were filled with everything from razor-sharp wires located at exactly head height to deadly snakes, all of which have been written off by actual experts as fanciful claims that have no basis in reality. Instead, the countermeasures in place to deter thieves tended to be just obstacles put in the path of the goods, such as huge slabs of granite or random debris and the like that would block the way. They also sometimes employed empty chambers with the real chamber containing the various goods walled up somewhere else in the structure. Other than these sort of rather quaint security measures, other deterrents tended to just be more metaphysical in nature, mostly limited to curses that would condemn a thief's soul to an eternity of perpetual agony or some such thing like that. For example, consider the following curse placed over the tomb of Pharaoh Amenhotep by one of his high priests, which threatened, amongst other things, that the thief would lose their earthly positions and honors, be incinerated in a furnace, in execration rites, capsize and drown at sea, have no successors, receive no no tomb or funerary offerings of their own, and their bodies would decay because they will starve without sustenance and their bones will perish. Given the widespread pilfering of tombs that went on back then and the fact that the person placing the curse would sometimes take part in said pilfering, it's safe to say that these sorts of curses weren't something that a lot of people took very seriously. Pharaoh Amenhotep got so annoyed with how often the tombs of his ancestors were being raided that he ordered the construction of a place known as the Set Maat, quite literally, Place of Truth, a village of conscripts charged with both building and protecting the tombs of nobility. The idea here was simple. The workers of the village would create the tombs and protect their creation since they relied on the state for their wages and homes. They would be loyal and discreet regarding the location of the tombs and the amount of treasure to be found within. However, frequent delays in the delivery of supplies to the villagers, including things like food and water and the basic nature of said payment, did little to foster trust and loyalty amongst the townsfolk, which, coupled with their intricate knowledge of the tombs themselves and exactly what treasure was stored within them and where, naturally led to widespread theft. Despite the isolated nature of the village, workers could still fence stolen goods by simply walking into a nearby city and trading the goods, often to those who would then do things like melt down the gold and create new objects that couldn't be traced back to the tomb. Now, all this said, it has been speculated that hematite powder, which when inhaled in sufficient quantities could potentially cause death, was used as something of a booby trap, if not a terribly effective one. For example, in one tomb discovered in 2001, there were several inches of this powder on the floor. It's also sometimes said that mercury was used as an intentional deterrent in many ancient tombs that have been discovered in China, like the burial site of Emperor Qi Xing Huang. This theory is universally dismissed by experts, though the sheer amount of mercury sometimes used was such that it could still pose a health hazard. For the most part, though, the tombs of the ancient pharaohs, kings, and emperors were protected, if at all, merely by simple physical barriers, abstract threats such as curses, and the ever-present risk of being horribly mutilated and killed should the perpetrator ever be caught, assuming they didn't simply bribe their way out of the situation. Unsurprisingly from this, the plundering of tombs was widespread and almost comically easy for certain subsets of the population who had access to the tombs and the right tools. Now, hopefully you're not going to be making any booby traps at home, but if you are one to tackle DIY projects, then I should tell you about Works. Works tools are designed to easily tackle every task for your home, your yard, and your workshop. Now, I moved to this new studio space a few months ago and I had to build some things. These uh, big things in the corner you see behind me here, these are base traps. They're made of wood, fabric, and rock. Well, I had to put these together. I also built a table in the other room, which we used to record our podcast, Brain Food. You should check that out. Now, Works, they make a bunch of stuff that is great for people who do this sort of DIY stuff. Particularly, there is the Works Pegasus work table. Great name as well. Now, they couldn't ship it to me in Europe, but they did send one out to Dave and he's based in the US and he tried it out and basically sung all of its praises. And David, by the way, is way more into DIY than me. These were really hard to do. Basically, it's a portable table and a sawhorse. It's super easy to set up and it's very lightweight, but it can still handle 300 pounds as a table and a thousand pounds as a sawhorse. It's got built-in clamps, a useful storage shelf, and all sorts of other handy stuff that just makes it better than ordinary workbench, the sort of thing I had to struggle with. You can get 10% off your first order by going to works with an X, W O R X dot com, and using the promo code BrainFood. Again, that's works dot com, and use the promo code BrainFood. Or if you're lazy, there's a link in the description below. And now, some bonus facts. 
Ever wonder why booby traps are called that? Well, want to know more? It turns out this has nothing to do with the memories of the fairer sex, that rather has its origins in the Spanish word bobo. It means stupid, fool, or naive. This Spanish word in turn comes from the Latin balbus, meaning stammering, which to the Romans was thought to be a sign of stupidity. So essentially, a booby trap is a trap that boobies or idiots are victims of. Around the same time this first popped up, we also have the expression booby prize, meaning a prize given to a fool. These prizes were usually something completely valueless and often given to the loser of some competition, with the first instance of this appearing in the late 19th century. In the early days, booby traps were simply just pranks. As you might expect, the first known instances of this applied to schoolboys pulling pranks on one another, with the victim then being considered a booby or a fool. For instance, one of the earliest known instances of booby trap appeared in the 1868 Chambers Journal, where it stated, a booby trap. It consisted of books, boots, etc., balanced on the top of a door, which was left ajar so that the first incomer got a solid shower bath. Now let's fast forward half a century or so because booby traps got a deadly upgrade. In World War I, deadly explosive traps were called this name. And now, if you're wondering how the word booby came to mean breasts, well, go check out our video on the subject, Why Are Breasts Called Boobs? Find a link below. Also, find a link below to works. And as always, Thank you for watching.